Hello everyone, uh, this is Ola. This is the third video about the neurophysiology. And um, here we will focus on the cholinergic receptors and some applications. Remember, we have the uh, receptors that, that work with the sympathetic nervous system, the adrenergic receptors. And here we are discussing the cholinergic receptors and their neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. The cholinergic receptors can be nicotinic receptors. For example, the nicotinic receptors are found at the neuromuscular junction, and it can be muscarinic receptors, and those are mostly working with the parasympathetic nervous system. So the acetylcholine is found in the central nervous system, and it stimulates both nicotinic and mascarinic within the CNS. Um, it is responsible for sleeping, wakefulness, and memory. So in case of Alzheimer's disease, the uh, receptors of acetylcholine, the cholinergic ones, are uh, not enough so that the patients with Alzheimer's disease tend to forget most of the times. At the neuromuscular junctions, there are nicotinic receptors, and acetylcholine here is excitatory. So it leads to depolarization, and the threshold can be achieved, so action potential happens, and uh, this leads to contraction of the muscles. At the level of the heart, for example, there are the mascarinic receptors, and here, acetylcholine is inhibitory. So it leads to hyperpolarization. Action potential is not likely to happen. So what happens to the heart rate? The heart rate decreases due to stimulation of the muscarinic receptors in the heart by the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So acetylcholine can be excitatory in one place, like at the neuromuscular junction, and inhibitory in another, like here in the heart. Do you remember the nerve that carries the parasympathetic fibers to the heart? The terminals of that nerve release acetylcholine. It is the vagus nerve. So the muscarinic receptors are found all over the body and they are active during the relaxation times with the parasympathetic nervous system activities. So they are found in the um, iris around the eye pupil. When it's stimulated, what would happen is constriction of the pupil of the eye. So at the level of the eye pupil, we have alpha-1 receptors and they lead to dilation of the eye pupil. And also we have the muscarinic receptors. When it's stimulated, this is pupillary constriction. Here at the level of the salivary glands, the acetylcholine is excitatory, so it stimulates salivation. How about at the level of the heart? At the level of the heart, it is inhibitory and it slows down the heart rate. How about in the lungs? You are relaxed here. You don't want a lot of oxygen going to your body system. So here the bronchi are gonna constrict during parasympathetic activity. How about, how about your digestive organs, the stomach, intestine, liver? All of these will, will be active to help with the digestive processes. Remember that the parasympathetic nervous system is the resting and digesting system. For the urinary bladder, it leads to contraction of the muscle of the urinary bladder, helping with urination. Okay, let's think here. There is a disease called myasthenia gravis. Here we have a neuromuscular disorder in which muscle weakness is caused by antibodies that block 
the acetylcholine receptors. So acetylcholine is there in the synapse, but the receptors are kind of blocked, so it's not able to uh, interact with, their, with the receptors. How about if you increase the amount of acetylcholine? Maybe this would overcome the receptors and help with that disease. So how can we um, treat that disease? We need to increase the level of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. So we need to give the patients a medication that helps to increase the acetylcholine. Remember that the enzyme acetylcholine esterase is the one that breaks down acetylcholine into a style group and choline group and then it can be recycled again. If we are able to give a medication that prevents acetylcholine stress enzyme, then acetylcholine will be there in the synapse and will not be broken down. And this is how we treat that disorder, by giving acetylcholine stress inhibitors, such as pyridostigmine. It's a medication that inhibits the acetylcholine stress enzyme. So there is a high level of acetylcholine in the synapse. Atropin is an antagonist for the muscarinic receptors. So it blocks the muscarinic receptors. So if you inject somebody with that medication, what would be the result? Now, let's think of the action resulting from a stimulation of the muscarinic receptors and reverse that. So what happens at the eye pupil when you stimulate the muscarinic receptors? the pupil constrict. So if you inhibit the muscarinic receptors, now the pupil dilates. And how about salivation? When acetylcholine stimulates its muscarinic receptors, salivation happens. But here, Atropin is an antagonist for the muscarinic receptors. So what would happen is dry mouth. Let's go down at the level of the heart. Remember, when you stimulate the heart muscarinic receptors, the heart rate decreases. Here you are blocking them, so the heart rate increases. How about in the lungs at the level of the uh, bronchioles. Muscarinic receptors stimulated in the bronchioles leads to bronchoconstriction. And here, if you are blocking them, the result would be bronchodilation. How about at the level of the digestive system, stomach, intestine? What do you think will happen here? You are blocking the muscarinic receptors. So the movement, the motility or peristalsis of the digestive system decreases. The enzyme secretion decreases. So you will not be digesting food. So here, atropin sometimes, or maybe decades ago, not recently, is used to treat colics or um, like excess movement of the, of the digestive canal because it prevents the muscarinic receptors decreasing the motility or movement. So here, if um, you reserve the action of acetylcholine stimulation of the muscarinic receptors, now you will get the action of atropin. What effect does a muscarinic agonist produce? If you stimulate the muscarinic receptors, like excessive stimulation of them would lead to what? Like the organ organophosphate poisoning, they inhibit the acetylcholine stress enzyme, leading to high level of acetylcholine. So what would happen as a result? So at the level of the eye, the pupil will be constricted. How about salivation? 
excess salivation. How about at the level of the heart? Heart rate drops. How about in the lungs? Bronchoconstriction. So this can lead to asthma. How about digestive system? Increasing digestive activity and movement. And this sometimes can lead to diarrhea. So this is the effect of excess acetylcholine or acetylcholine agonist. So this would be would lead to excess stimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, let's go with some review questions. What effect does a nicotinic agonist produce at the level of the neuromuscular junction? Acetylcholine stimulates the nicotinic receptors at the neuromuscular junction. Agonist is the medication that does the same thing like the neurotransmitter. So here, what would result is muscle contraction. How about if you block the nicotinic receptors at the level of the neuromuscular junction, then muscle relaxation would be the result. Muscle paralysis. Muscarinic receptor antagonist causes pupillary what? So muscarinic agonist produces constriction of the pupil. So plucker or antagonist produce the opposite. So dilation of the pupil of the eye. Actually, eye drops having muscarinic antagonists are used during eye checkup. So they dilate the pupil of the eye and then the physician will be able to see through your eye. Alpha-1 agonist causes pupillary what? Alpha-1 are found in the eye pupil and when stimulated, this is pupillary also dilation. So dilation of the pupil can be induced by either blocking the muscarinic receptors or stimulating the alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. Suggest two ways of medications that decrease the heart rate. Okay, so to decrease the heart rate, we can stimulate the muscarinic receptors so this is going to be muscarinic agonist or you block beta-1 receptors. So the opposite of its action happens by beta-1 antagonist or blocker. What receptors are found in the neuromuscular junction? They are the nicotinic receptors. How about the muscarinic, the uh, cholinergic receptors in the heart? They are the muscarinic receptors. Okay, suggest so three ways that boost the action of neurotransmitters. We can boost or increase or enhance the action of the neurotransmitter or mimic the action of the neurotransmitter by one of three ways. So give an agonist, which is a medication exactly like the neurotransmitter, or reuptake inhibitor. So those medications will keep the neurotransmitters in the synapse, preventing their reuptake back into the presynaptic neuron. Like specific serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They prevent the reuptake of serotonin into the presynaptic cell, so it stays in the synapse, stimulating the postsynaptic cell, keeping you happy because it's used in a treatment of depression. The third way which applies to some neurotransmitters like acetylcholine is to give a medication that inhibits the enzyme responsible for breaking down the neurotransmitter. Like 
Acetylcholine stress enzyme inhibitors. They inhibit the acetylcholine stress enzyme, so acetylcholine is kept at a higher level in the synapse. What is the only way that inhibits the action of a neurotransmitter? Just one way, which is giving a blocker or antagonist. Blocker or antagonist are the same. Now, let's discuss some toxins. Um, the botulinum toxin is released from a bacteria that we call Clostridium botulinum. And that toxin inhibits the release of acetylcholine from the axon terminals. So there will be no acetylcholine in the synapse. Think of that at, at only the level of the neuromuscular junction. At the level of the neuromuscular junction, if there is no acetylcholine, muscle paralysis happen. Remember that the diaphragm also needs acetylcholine to be able to contract and help you to breathe in. So this can lead to death due to paralysis of the diaphragm. It's found in uh, honey. Sometimes that's why babies under one year cannot uh, be fed on honey. The uh, toxin curare prevents the interaction of acetylcholine with its nicotinic receptors. So here, acetylcholine can go into the synapse, but this just prevents that acetylcholine to interact with the nicotinic receptors. Also, this leads to muscle paralysis and death can happen when the diaphragm is paralyzed. The copra venum uh, toxin, this also binds to acetylcholine receptors, preventing acetylcholine from interacting with them. So it is the same mechanism like curare. Saxitoxin and tetradotoxin both block the voltage-gated sodium channels everywhere in the body. This means there is no action potential anywhere in the body because the threshold can be achieved. That's fine. But the voltage-gated sodium channels everywhere in the body is blocked. So no action potential. This is the most generalized toxin and this can lead to death quickly. The nerve gas, which is the uh, organophosphate poisoning, this one inhibits the acetylcholine stress enzyme. So acetylcholine level increases in the synapse. We have high level of acetylcholine. This is serious when it comes to the lungs because this will lead to severe bronchoconstriction and not enough oxygen will be inhaled. Um, the same like neostigmine, it does the same mechanism like the nerve gas. The strychnine toxin, it's a very painful one. This one prevents the inhibitory post-synaptic potentials in the spinal cord that inhibit the contraction of the antagonistic muscles. What does it mean? When you contract a group of muscles, like you contract the anterior arm muscles, your biceps and brachialis, then automatically the antagonistic muscle, which is the triceps, becomes relaxed. You cannot contract a muscle of flexion and a muscle of extension at the same time. So when you do um, a flexor muscle, when it contracts, the extensor one becomes relaxed. But this inhibits this. So the strychnine will lead to contraction of every muscle in the body at the same time, which is so painful. And this, of course, leads to death. 
Okay, let's do some review questions. Botulinum toxin causes paralysis. By what mechanism? Remember that botulinum toxin prevents the release of acetylcholine in the synapse. So acetylcholine stays in the presynaptic cells. Tetrodotoxin blocks what kind of channels? The voltage-gated sodium channels, and thus it inhibits every action potential in the body. The nerve gas inhibits what enzyme? The acetylcholine stress enzyme, so high level of acetylcholine will be in the synapse. The copra venom blocks what type of receptors at the neuromuscular junction? The nicotinic receptors, so paralysis happens in every muscle of the body.